So we're going to talk about that today. In fact, uh, a lot of our chat today will be about collisions. So uh, you can see here that we've got an O of K solution. Now, Ben mentioned earlier that we could have a collision. So let's talk a little bit about that. So in addition to banana, let's say we have a berry flavor. And now you can see the problem because when we calculate the hash code or the smart index, if you will, of banana, we get a 1. And then if we calculate the hash code or the smart index of berry, we also get a 1. And it could very well be that banana is stored over here. And then we go to store berry, and we can't because the slot is already occupied by banana. So when this happens, we say we have a collision. And it turns out that a hash table like this has two different ways of dealing with collisions. One is called open addressing, and the other is called closed addressing. Opening addressing itself has several different techniques that can be used. We're only going to discuss one of them in this class, and that's called linear probing. Another technique, which we won't really talk about very much, is called quadratic probing. And then there are several other methods that can be used also. Linear probing is simple. All it says is that if you're going to put something into the array and the slot is used, you just find the next slot that's empty and you put it there. So in this scheme, if we were going to insert them in this order, Apple would show up here. Then at location 15, somewhere down here, we would put pecan. And then when we had the collision with berry and banana, we have no room here, so then we would just put berry into the next position right over here. <clears throat> so what do you think of my little scheme here for using this uh, technique for storing and retrieval? I want you to discuss what's good about it and what's bad about it. And in particular, I want you to consider if we had, like if I was to write the letters underneath each of these, right, like this. Do you think there are likely to be traffic jams on near parts of the array that are going to be as they fill up? And do you think other parts of the array might come out being underutilized, knowing what you know about the English language? Forget that we're storing pie flavors. Just pretend we're storing some random words that just are happening in the English language. Where would the, where would the traffic jams show up on this array, and where would parts of the array be like unusually empty? Would, would that phenomenon happen, for example? Can you think of two indexes in this array that would be extremely popular? Two consecutive indexes that would be extremely popular? Mr. Mariak, sir, looking at this, if each of these represents a letter of the alphabet, can you think of one place here where two of the letters are going to be extremely popular and consecutive? I think S and T would be far more popular than A and B. A is very popular, B is not as popular. But you agree that S and T would be extremely popular we're likely to get a traffic jam near there, don't you think? Can you think of another part of the array which would be extremely lightly loaded? Like W, X, Y, Z, that whole area would probably be lightly loaded. Using the first letter of each word like this and generating a hash code from it is not such a great idea because in an in a ideal situation, what we really want, what we really want is we want a hashing mechanism to distribute our entries evenly over the array without any kind of bias. Here you see that we have a bias because of the English language where the S and T indexes are going to be crowded and the other areas near W, X, Y, and Z are going to be lightly loaded. Clustering refers to areas in the uh, hash table that create traffic jams. What might be another technique? Now, there's another issue here which I haven't gotten to, and let me talk about that for a second. Um, let's say that I got rid of these words here. And let's say I had these two words. Now, in my existing hashing scheme, I think you will agree that these two would have the same exact hash code. You agree, right? Because they use the letter C. Um, if we were to use the first two letters instead, use them in some combination somehow, can you see that we would still have a collision? In fact, even if we use the first three letters, we would still have a collision. So what we want in our best case scenario for creating a hash function is we want similar words to have wildly different hash codes. That's what we would like to have happen. That doesn't happen with the hash code function that we've created, does it? 
So let's go back and look at some other examples here. Let's say we have a bunch of words here that we want to store. Can you think of some way we could use every single letter to try to come up with an index? Now, I know that one of the problems you're worried about is that you might generate an index that's too large. In other words, we can't really have any indexes greater than 25. You agree with that, right? Because that's the size of our array. Now, if we generate this hash function, right, where we put in some thing here, in this case it's going to be a string and it generates a number for us. If we want this thing to be an index into this array, you understand that the range of this function has to be 0 to the size of our array, 0 to 25. You see that, right? What would be one easy way we could make sure that whatever number is generated here fits into a range that's predefined? What could we do to this number to make sure that it never goes out of bounds? Yes? We could mod it. Here, we would mod it by 26 to make sure that the results are going to be in this range right here, like that. And this is often done where this is the size of the array that you have available, right? And so here we can use a more sophisticated technique to generate a hash code, and then we can take whatever we finish with and modulo it by the size of our array. Now try to understand that I'm giving you an example with a very small array and only a few words. In practice, it would be a large array with a huge number of inputs. You see that, right? So now my question is, can you think of some relatively simple scheme where we could take different words and try to find some sort of hash function where car and carpet would generate different values? frog and snail, all of these would generate something different. It's OK if once in a while we have a collision. But try to work with your partner now and come up with a hashing scheme for different strings. What do you think? The ideal hashing scheme will use all the information in each word. It won't just use one letter. It'll use all the letters. How might we be able to generate an index using all the letters? Uh, Mr. Schulzen, what do, you, do you have an idea for how we might be able to hash these uh, strings? That's what I was hoping you would suggest, sir. So let's, uh, let's do that. So C, uh, that would be position 2. A would be position 0. And what would R be, by the way? I'm going to guess, what, 17? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. OK, so we have these. Uh, we have these three numbers. What do you want to do with them, sir? Uh, add them to the OK, and then we got 19. And, and then should we do anything to the number? Mod. We want to mod it, probably. <clears throat> and that would be a good example of a hashing scheme that used all the information. It's not a perfect hashing scheme, but it's a good hashing scheme. Now, it turns out for strings, you don't even need to do anything fancy because strings have hash codes built in. And you may not have ever noticed that the string class has a hash code function, but you can use that. And if the hash code is going to be some giant number that is a little bit unwieldy for you, you can lop it down to size by using this modulo operator to have it come back into the range that you want for your size array. And if you were, for example, to only use the first letter, we would get clustering at ST, because that would be a very popular area of the array. Okay, clustering is something we want to avoid. I mentioned to you that we are, there are two ways to deal with collisions. Open addressing, we could use linear probing. Quadratic probing, can anyone guess, instead of moving one over, that would be a linear strategy. What would the quadratic strategy be? Yes, sir. We're going to move n square over, where n is the number of collisions we have. So you can see, now why do you think someone would want to do quadratic probing instead of linear probing? Why, why do you think that, that someone would want to do that? Yes? Avoid clustering. We want to avoid the clustering. So what happens with linear probing is once you get a traffic jam here, then you, as you add more stuff, the traffic jam gets worse and worse. You see that, right? Because the next car that shows up in this traffic jam and goes to the end makes the traffic jam worse. But if we do quadratic probing, when we have a, a, a collision, we can move it far away instead of right next to it and make the, 
the situation worse. You see that, right? So it's a more sophisticated hashing technique, but we're not going to bother with that. I'll let you read about some of the other ones. There's some fancy stuff out there. So that is one way to do it. I want to talk about one other issue about li li uh, open addressing, which you may not have thought of immediately. <clears throat> Let's go back to our strategy here for uh, storing banana and berry. You know what, let's go back to our earlier technique where we use only the first letter. We use the first letter. So if we use the first letter, you agree that banana and berry will create a collision, right? Because they both use the letter, a, letter B. So we store banana here, and then when we go to store berry, we see that this slot is used so that we move berry and put it over here. We're all good so far, right? Now imagine that later on, you decide to delete banana. Okay, so you've deleted banana. So you delete it like that. So now there's a hole here, right? Later on, you search for berry. So you search for berry, you put it through the hash function, so one is empty, what would you erroneously conclude? That you don't have berry. You see the problem here, right? So when we have this weird situation where we're using linear probing and we're having to park our uh, assets one over, when we delete, when we delete, we have to put a marker here to say that something used to be there. And that way, when we're looking for stuff, if we happen to come across one of these markers, what should we do? We keep going and looking. When do we stop looking and conclude we don't have it? Marker. When we reach an empty space that has no marker. Can you see how this could get annoying and complicated.